Master and Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture. Oh, suddenly I got some volume here. Uh, welcome. This is the Saturday night, 10th of June, here in Berkeley, California. The Avatamsaka Sutra's 10 grounds chapter. Sutra lecture, zeroing in on the 8th ground out of 10. So if that's what you came to hear, you're in the right place. Let's get started by chanting the... Uh, name of the sutra and the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas who spoke it. It's on the front of our booklet and I'm told that the text for people who are joining us on YouTube or uh, other media, there is a text available out to you. And the very person who can tell us how to find that is currently not at his keyboard. He's zeroing in the lens so you all can see. But we'll, we'll get him behind the keyboard and you can check the chat function there in YouTube and he'll give you a link. You click on that link and it'll take you right to where you can find this text so you can follow along with what, uh, what I'm explaining. First thing we're going to do is chant the title. It's right there on the cover.
萨，南无大放光佛，华严具音，华严海会，佛菩萨南。大放光佛，华严经，华严，佛菩萨，南无大放，华严经，华严海会。So, uh, Mr. Techman, would you do that? Would you put out the link for the sutra? So that means that people who are, by the way, those of you who are crouching back there in the corner are invited to come fill in the front first, please. Notice, four of our number just filled right in the front, just the way they're supposed to, without my telling them. Everybody else needs a little bit of a prompting to come in and fill in the empty spaces. There's nobody going to be sitting in front of you tonight. So nobody wants to crawl over you to get to those empty spaces. So Master Hua would always encourage us to Qin Liang Wang Champions Wu. Yeah, great. There you go. Okay. So uh, Jerry has put the link to the sutra text online. That is to say, if you are watching on YouTube and you also would like to check out the text, uh, which we have here in our hands, there's an online version and it's on that link that you'll find in the chat box there on YouTube. Now, if you're watching after the fact, we might paste that in down below in the show more section of this webcast. Okay, um, let's turn to page four and five. Four in the Chinese, five in the English. We're down at the bottom. Okay, you ready? So I'm going to put my palms together and I'll read the Chinese. You're invited to join me. And if you, uh, if you found it in online and you don't have the page numbers that we have, it's the four line verse that goes, Yu bi yi che cha du zhong, right there. And the English is within each one of those lands. Okay, you can find that if you're just counting from the top. It should be paragraph, quatrain, you know, stanza one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're on stanza eight. Okay, ready? Here we go. Yu bi yi che cha du zhong. Xi you ru lai yan miao yin. Sui shun yi che zhong shang xin. Wei zhuan zui shang jing fa lun. Okay, over to the right, page five now. Ready? Can we do it together? Let's read in unison. Here we go. Within each one of those lands, there are Tathagatas proclaiming in a wondrous voice following the thoughts of each living being and turning the sublime and pure dharma wheel for them. Okay. This is the Ten Grounds chapter of a big sutra. The Ten Grounds chapter is pretty close to the end. And it's a long chapter, and we've been doing this for eight years now. Eight years, one, one chapter. And we're on the eighth part of that chapter and just begun the eighth part. The chapter talks about bodhisattvas. These very unselfish 
beings. You could say human beings with unselfish hearts. You'd be right. Doesn't matter if they're women, if they're men. Doesn't matter. That's not where the energy is. On the bodies they're wearing at the moment. What matters is their attitude. They want to help. And the Bodhisattva path is a long path. It's a long training period. And you go progressively. Some You could think of it as from the bottom to the top. The top being Buddhahood. The bottom being a uh, brand new Bodhisattva. Somebody who wants to wake up and wake others up too. So... This chapter is a handbook. It's a training manual. It's a how-to. We've been describing it that way. Kind of like a science text, in a way. That tells you how to make transformations using this material and that material, putting it together and something changes. Kind of like a science book like that. Or, you know better, another... Mm, how many people last touched a science textbook? Probably not since high school, right? But... How many of you have touched a cookbook recently? Oh, every hand goes up. Cookbooks, you bet. Wow, cooking is hot now. No pun. Cooking is popular. What does a cookbook tell you to do? Same thing. Add these ingredients. Put it in heat. Put it in cold. Watch it change. Serve it delicious. Right? We love cookbooks because the result is, mmm, you know. That experience of flavor. The Avatamsaka Sutra is a lot like that. It's a how-to. You put things together, you mix it up, bake it the right amount of heat, right length of time, something wonderful comes out of the oven. And it gets harder as you go. It gets harder as you go up the path. Because why? Saying it's a cookbook, saying it's a textbook... That's all metaphor. It's not none of those things. It's a description of your body and mind when you add the Buddha's methods, the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teachings. That's what it's for. And there's an idiom in the Chinese tradition that says there are 84,000 methods of practice because there are 84,000 things that go wrong with us. <laughs> 84,000 hassles and problems and miseries and unsatisfying conditions. And how many of you gone through? How many of you experienced? Oh, 83,996. There are four I haven't had, right? Okay, well, maybe. So, I hope you've used 83,000 946 methods to counteract. So, all the 84,000 methods, metaphor, right? Not that many, maybe 85,000, maybe 83,000, but a lot of methods which are there to, as they say, hua, fanao. They're there to take a cross, to teach, to change your troubles. That's what they're for. You don't cut off troubles, you change them. You change your way of seeing what's going on. And the pain goes away. Right? That's what those methods are for. So, that's the real thing that's going on. It's not really a cookbook, but it's like a cookbook. Because you start out with, you know, an egg or eggless mixture, and then flour and sugar and water, and out come cookies. Mmm, everybody loves cookies. So, before you only had the ingredients, now you've got something delicious to eat. Before, we only had misery. We had the Buddha Dharma, we do what it says, and what, com what comes out? Peace of mind, contentment, satisfaction, ease, just a sense of well-being. And most of all, absence of hassle, absence of anxiety, no fear, no doubts, no worries. No beating yourself up. Because why? The affliction's gone. That inner pressure is gone. Thank you, Buddha, for laying out these methods. So, here it is. This is the handbook. This is the how-to. Okay, that's kind of where we are. And the Bodhisattva here is going up this 
this progressive ladder of knowledge of the Bodhisattva path. And as he goes, as she goes, he's learning more methods, more techniques, more ways to cope. Tonight, there's a really interesting definition of those methods. What is it? It says, Yu bi yi che cha du zhong shi yo ru lai yan miao yin. Within each one of these lands, there's a Buddha speaking Dharma with a voice that we like to hear, a wondrous voice. All right, put it in context. Last couple of weeks, uh, we're starting the eighth ground, and when the, the grounds begin, what happens is the devas or whoever, wherever the sutra is being lectured, they come out and they go, Yay! Yay! Go, Buddha! Speak that Dharma! Give me a D. Give me an H. What's its spell? Buddha Dharma. Uh, Dharma. Yeah, that's right. I just forgot the thing. And the Buddha speaks the Dharma. And the devas, they throw flowers in the air and they light incense and they play their music. And last week, it keeps talking about music. Maybe it's piano music, right? Maybe it's violin. Maybe it's cello. Maybe it's guqin music. Um, according to our stained glass windows here, um, let's see, the musician is over here. That musician's got a harp, right? A strung harp. So, yeah, that's the way they always picture the devas, is they're musicians. Because they're happy, and they're making incredible music that just, here on earth, we don't get to hear it. Okay, what's the finest music on earth? Oh, some people would say Rachmaninoff. Other people would say Chopin, right? Other people would say Franz Liszt's Transcendental Etudes are the finest. Other people would say Johann Sebastian Bach, obviously. Other people would say, uh, you know, death metal is the finest. Right? No, probably not. Other people would say the Buddha's names, chanted. The finest music. So every culture, every time has its finest music. What they say is the finest music on the planet cannot compare to the sounds that devas make in the heavens. When the devas make their music, oh my goodness, it's just sublime. Um, let's see. Hey, Mr. Yap, can I, can I bu bug you out of Samadhi? We're missing a layer of lights here. You want to turn those on? Yeah, thank you. Sorry to get you out of full lotus there. Okay, there we go. Yeah, those two. Yeah, let there be light. So, what happens here? So, we, we heard about that. We heard about the devas just saying, you know, Bodhisvaha or hallelujah or whatever devas say. Praise the Buddha. And then it shifted, just, just as if the next chapter happened. And suddenly it took us deeply into a micro realm where it said, here's what's going on in nature, in the actual environment where the Buddha is speaking the Dharma. We can see in, they went to these strange anatomical analogies. It said on the tip of a hair, Right, right there. On the tiny, it's pretty small, the tip of a hair, there are many, 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 many lands. Something huge compresses into something tiny. And, of course, that's miraculous, right? Does that happen? Science can't measure that. Then it says, further, in a skin pore, something equally tiny, right? I can't even see skin pores, but definitely the very thing that we sweat from and the very thing that we breathe through, our skin pores, small. Even so, there are huge lands, countries, planets, you might think, solar systems. How many? As many as there are dust particles in a cubic inch of air, a lot. It says, again, same principle. Something huge is contained in something small and there's no pressure. There's no colliding. There's no, 
friction. Okay, so you go, uh uh-uh, nope, never read about that anywhere. So what is this? This is called one of the uh, inconceivable, it's called Shi Shen Man, the Ten Doors of Mystery. And why don't I see it that way? The short answer is myself gets in the way. The principle is, if your self was gone, you'd see it. Because this is, the Buddha says, yep. Particularly, the Avatamsaka Sutra talks about it this way. It's mysterious, and you, you know, some of us hear that and our, our brains go, click, shut. Others go, whoa, trippy, far out. Right, it is, it's completely that. So, but this is just one of what are called ten doors, gateways to mystery. Wait till you get to time. There are, there are equally amazing truths about time that occur in the sutra. All right. So we got the big into the small. Now, tonight, it takes it a step further. It's not just so much like, okay, the Buddha is proposing that something very huge can fit into something very small. Inside that very small, there's things going on. It's alive. The universe is alive. And what's alive in there? Within each one of these lands, there are Buddhas speaking in a wondrous voice. Okay? So it's a Buddha land. And where the Buddha is, hmm, there's light. There's that incredibly good vibe. That feeling of being right where you should be, where you've always wanted to be. No past, no future, because past and future all become one incredible present moment. And the Buddha is there just confirming everything good about you and banishing everything bad about you because good and bad about you are a matter of ego, the self. And the Buddha's light just inspires us to see right through that constructed self. How wonderful. Imagine if, you know, all those thoughts of, I'm just here doing nothing, wasting time. I got nothing to do. I got no plan, no strategy. I'm just kind of lost and afraid in a world I hope I didn't make. All that stuff just goes poof, like a bubble popping and you're like, you know, I'm totally perfect and complete right this minute, not lacking anything. What a feeling. That's, you know, I'm making it up, right? But... That must be what it's like in the Buddha's light. Just that sense of, I am completely existing right here. Can't be improved. Can't be reduced. You can't add a bit to my Buddha nature. You can't take a bit of my Buddha nature. This is me, complete, full, perfect, as is. Thank you, Omitofo. You know? <laughs> and why not? How come we don't know that right now? Well, it's because you don't know my story. Well, you, uh, you, got, you, don't know, you don't know my old man. Oh, well, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We all have our you know, baggage. And it's because we need more of that Buddha's light to just break right through the baggage, all that stuff. Who says? Who says that you're deficient? Well, uh, I do. Right. It's a way of looking. So look different. Listen to the Buddha's wondrous voice. What does he do? Look at that third line. He follows every living being's thoughts and turns the supreme Dharma wheel just for them. Pretty amazing. Okay, think about that. It says that the Buddha, first of all, knows what you're thinking. Second of all, has a faman, has a method for you. Tells you how to cure your blues. Just for you. That's compassion, right? These, um, how do you react when you hear something like this? You can dismiss it, you can ignore it, you can laugh at it, I suppose, or you can go, that's amazing. P. 
people reported at Gold Mountain Monastery and at CTTB, City of 10,000 Buddhas, when Master Hua would speak Dharma, I mean, I had this experience and I heard it from so many people. Shurfa would be lecturing along every night, as he did, and he would get to a place in the sutra and he would comment on it and you would have this experience, "Uh uh-oh, Shurfu knows what I'm thinking. And he said that for me. That happened so many times. And you'd go, oh, he knows all of my secrets. And yet somehow I don't feel afraid of it, but it's like, gulp. He, he, he wants me to change. Okay, I got to change now. You'd have that feeling, and you'd, you know, afterwards you'd be driving home or something, and you'd say, boy, Shurfu really nailed me with that one. The person next to you would go, no, no, that was for me. I, you mean Shurf, that, that teaching that you, th- no, that was, that was mine, that was for me. He saw right inside me, and he, you know, and you'd, really? Everybody had that same feeling. Somehow that Shurfu was just directing his principles, his, his teachings, how to use the Dharma, was coming right for you. Now, is it possible that multiple people could be all right? Shurfu was teaching just for you? I think so. And this verse right here, at the bottom of the page, is going to pop up again. We're going to hear more times when um, the uh, it's the Bodhisattva, it's not the Buddha, but the Bodhisattva will describe how he can teach multiple beings at once. So, just keep that in mind as we get there. It's all a function of the awakened mind. It's not apart from you right this minute, but we just haven't learned to operate that software yet. So, another thing to, to another way to look at this is how compassionate this is. It's not cold, right? It's not that you have to like please the Buddha or make him happy before he will teach you or he's busy teaching somebody else now and can't be bothered with your small problem. Not. It's not what it says. We have a hard time matching the breadth of the Buddha's compassion. Mostly we fall short in understanding what compassion can do. So, That's what it says. In all these lands, so many, as many as dust particles in the hair pore of the Buddhas or in the tip of a hair, there are Buddhas who are speaking in a wonderful voice. A voice that people like to hear. And what he's talking about everywhere is what you were just thinking and how to kind of back your car out of the narrow garage of that neurotic thought that you just parked inside of and shut the door, (laughs) shut the garage door on yourself. The Buddha got a way to open that door and back your car out and say, oh, look, hey, the road goes everywhere you want to go. Just go somewhere. Okay, turn the page, please. Page six, page seven. More, more stuff about the prelude before the eighth ground, right? This is all preparation for the eighth ground. Here we go. Cha zhong 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 shang shan shan zhong fu yo zhong zhong cha ren tian zhu qu ge ge yi fo xi zhi yi wei shuo fa Within the lands are all manner of sentient beings' bodies. And in their bodies again, are all manner of lands, including humans, devas, and every sort of destiny. The Buddha knows and explains the Dharma for them all. It gets even neater, even cooler. This is so neat, right? So we're looking at many lands. And here we got a land. Our land is called California. This land is yours, right? I won't do it for you. Um, Phil Oaks has the best one. It's called The Power and the Glory. 
Come on and take a walk with me through this green and growing land. Walk through the meadows and the valleys and the sand. Walk through the mountains and the rivers and the plains. Walk through the sun and walk through the rain. Here is a land full of power and glory, beauty that words cannot recall. All the power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Glory shall rest on us all. That's a Phil Oaks song. That, uh, it's patriotic, you know, patriotic song. But patriotism, if it comes from the heart and is innocent and true and not one party or the other, is a noble virtue. Love of country when it's genuine and authentic and true is wholesome. From Colorado, Kansas to the Carolinas too, Virginia to Alaska, from the old to the new, Texas and Ohio and the California shore, tell me who could ask for more, says Phil Oaks. Here's a land full of power and glory. So this is worldly lands, right? But here in our sutra are Buddha lands. Imagine what a Buddha land would be like. Imagine. Right? Where could we compare it to? Gold Coast, Queensland. There we go. People in the Gold Coast like to say, we're living in paradise. And a lot to be said for it. Beautiful weather, beautiful beaches. Open-hearted people. People who go to Maui say the same thing about Hawaii. Oh my. There are people who go to Kauai and Hawaii just never want to return. Right? And we live in downtown Berkeley. Ho, ho. We are urban. And a lot of us live in mm, Oakland, right? Santa Clara. Ooh, San Jose. Fairfield, right? Some of us live in Alameda. And we're urban. We're surrounded by people and concrete and engines burning fossil fuels. And it's a land. And it's full of power and glory. So Phil Oaks finishes that song. I've got to give you the last verse. It's a wonderful verse. He says, For she's only as rich as the poorest of the poor, only as free as the padlocked prison door, only as strong as our love for this land, only as tall as we stand. For here is a land full of power and glory, beauty that words cannot recall. All our power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. How strong is our freedom? Glory shall rest on us all. So, bless his heart, Phil Oaks, the late Phil Oaks from Ohio. He's an alumni with all of my family except me at Ohio State University. How about that? So, we all have lands, right? Where is your land? Most of us have multiple lands, not just one. It's hard to find a real San Franciscan. It's hard to find a genuine birth Berkeleyite. They're out there, but most of us come from somewhere else. Right? So, within those lands, all manner of sentient beings' bodies. Okay, we're leaving humanity. Just green light, blink, 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 leaving humanity, going to other species. In their bodies, there are, again, all manner of lands. So, wow, here's the Avatamsaka Sutra doing this flashing thing, interpenetrating without obstruction. We've got a world with lands, land and world pretty much interchangeable. We have this place where beings dwell, and on it are all these different kinds of beings, not just humans, but right, animals, ghosts, asuras, devas, hell dwellers, right? All these different kinds of living beings, each with their bodies. And then it goes into the bodies of the beings and it says there are lands inside each of them. So everything's moving, everything's alive in the sutra. Just like what? Imagine, you know, take a breath. Okay, how many beings did I just inhale? And there are people who would say trillions, depending on how small you're looking. With every breath, we're inhaling carbon atoms. What is 
the earth made up of? Carbon atoms. What are our bodies made up of? Carbon atoms, right? Hydrocarbons. And we exchange them with the trees. How many living beings in a tree? <whistles> yeah, well, it depends on how you count them. But one tree probably has, you know, hundreds of thousands of beings living in them, all interacting, being eaten or eating. Man, oh man. Uh, when you, you know, here, today, uh, today, I saw a beetle walk under my foot. And it was a shock because it's the first insect I'd seen for three weeks. We here in California, there aren't like the air is not full of bugs. Where I grew up around Lake Erie, the Great Lakes, oh my goodness. Summer is bug time. All kinds of bugs everywhere. And where I've been for the last four or five months, Gold Coast, Australia, you see how things really stand. Uh, I think I told this story, but um, it's a shocker how when you're not hiding from birth and death, from the cycles of being alive, as soon as you have something alive, you have something on its way to being dead, right? And then reborn. So I'm sitting behind a screen door and it's a sliding screen door and I was down on the floor and I was looking at a moth and this moth had, during the night, had come for refuge on my screen. Probably he was after the light in my, on the Buddha altar. Got as far as the screen. So I saw outside the butcher bird, mother and daughter had come. The butcher birds are, it's a family unit. Uh, usually there's four or five. And there's, the other three are uncles. But there's a mom and a daughter, and the mom is teaching the daughter how to be a grown-up butcher bird. It was butcher bird school, and I absolutely know it was, because I got pictures of the baby watching mom do stuff. But this particular morning, I had noticed that against, on my screen was this moth. It was a good-sized moth. And just, you know, brilliant. Moths come in such incredible uh, artistry on their wings. They're just, their wings are painted. They're just beautiful. So I was watching it, and it was there. It wasn't moving much. But outside the screen door, the butcher birds landed on my railing. They're like six feet away. And, oh, hi, you know. And I feed them crackers. They really, really like crackers. And the fact that I feed the baby, I give the mother a break when I feed crackers to the baby. And these butcher birds have this amazing ability to catch things in midair. It's, they're circus birds, I swear. You take a little piece of cracker, a little thing, and you go flip, and before, while it's still rising, the butcher bird has flown up, grabbed it, and has sat back down. They're not like waiting for it to do this. They're like, they meet it in midair. Their eyesight is so good, and their reflexes are faster than the eye can see. So I do circus tricks with the butcher birds, right? Got to know them. And so... I slid open the glass door, and here the moth was still there. So I slid the screen back, and then I thought, oh, poor moth, it must have its feet caught in the mesh of my screen. So I went from this side, of this, the, the moth is on this side, I'm on this side of the screen. So I went, flick, like that, flicked into the air, glop, gone, no more moth. And I went, ugh. I just delivered the moth to the butcher bird. Oh, man. And the butcher bird was like, thanks. <laughs> hey, that was great. Do that again? You know, and I'm like, oh. Is that, a, is that a broken precept that I just, you know, am I culpable for killing the moth? If I hadn't gone flick, maybe the butcher bird wouldn't have seen it. Not for sure. They're, they're really, they check all the crevices of the roof of my porch. If there's a spider, they flunk come back down, whoop, you know. But just to see the, the moth die in front of my eyes in an instant, down the throat of the butcher bird, was like, right, that's birth and death. It's that fast. And immediately, you know, I reflected, when we go, what's it like? You know, you don't, we don't get a, like a, 
a tribute like they have in the movies. You know, heroic death. You don't get to pose. You don't get last words. You know, your poem before you go, you're just gone. You know, and we're wandering again. But wow, just to see that, how quickly the moth's life was over. It was food for the butcher. And the butcher bird was like, like that, you know. Food for the bird. And then, flying overhead comes the big eagle. Wedge-tailed eagles. We have a nest of them on the property. And they're like, it's Australia's largest bird. They are major raptors. And they eat other birds. And so, as soon as the shadow comes, somebody, that I don't know, I couldn't tell who it was, but somebody in the neighborhood gives the signal. And it's... And everybody goes... All the birds are like, pulled in like this, make themselves small and wait for the shadow of the eagle to go away, including the butcher birds. Because why? They in turn are lunch for the big bird. So it's, oh, whoa. Eating and being eaten, right? So here we are. That's life. And here I'm, I'm this bleeding heart, tree hugging, you know, granola eating liberal type who's like, oh, the poor moth. You know, whereas the butcher bird's like, whoa, that was great. And this is business as usual in the bush and actually in every land. It's what it's like. What we get here is the Avatamsaka has no bloodshed, has no mm, unresolved misery or suffering. Every dukkha, every bit of suffering gets transformed. Okay? So... We have sentient beings, bodies of many, many kinds in this land. And then it goes to the bodies and it says in each body there are furthermore there are more lands. Who is there? Humans, devas, and every sort of destiny. Furthermore, the Buddha speaks for all of them. Can you imagine the Buddha speaking deva language? The Buddha speaking human language? The Buddha speaking bird language, ghost language. That's what it says. So how does that work? Some sort of universal translator. Some sort of Google machine translator. So there are 200, what, 230 something major languages, something like that. Lots of little dialects, but major. And nobody knows them all. All humans, but we just do this different thing with our tongue, which of course corresponds to different things in our consciousness. And yet, if I said, you know, tea mug and held it up, everybody would have a different word for it from their different language. But the thing itself is the same. Interesting, huh? And not mutually intelligible. Where we are down in southern Taiwan, there's a place called Mainong. Uh, Meinong is the headquarters of the Kujia. Uh, not to say minority, the Kujia uh, community. They're known as Hakka, right? And came from China. And there were some indigenous, but they mostly came from China. And they settled down in southern Taiwan. And they're definitely ethnic Chinese, but they are Kujaren, and they speak different kinds of Kujia Hakka dialect, sometimes don't understand each other in the same town if they're speaking their own Kujia Hua. Same is true in Malaysia. They're Kujaren in Malaysia. They're Kujaren in Hong Kong. And it's not the case that if you're Kujaren, you're going to understand the other Kujaren. How about that? It's that 
diverse, so much diversity. And so here's the Buddha who can go, yeah, I speak Kudzya, which one? I definitely, I got your number. <laughs> Pretty amazing, right? So I am proud to say that I am getting to the point where I can tell pure Hong Kong Cantonese from Toi San Cantonese, from Guangzhou Cantonese, and from Vietnamese Cantonese. I can tell the difference. When uh, Dharma Master Hung Gui, one of our senior nuns, is translating into Cantonese, oh, it's different. Right, Guoji? Really different. It's all Cantonese, but it's Hong Kong is kind of the, you know, the, the lingua franca of Cantonese. Can't do it. I don't. I can't even fake it. Cantonese is hard. I have a classmate, by golly, Ed, who speaks perfect Cantonese. He's this round-eyed, blue-eyed guy. Speaks perfect Cantonese. So how strange that you know all these different languages. So what is there a common language? Here we go. What about music? Mm. Now, people say, oh, it's not a language. Well, it certainly communicates. What does a language need? A language needs subjects, objects, and verbs. Syntax and phrases, rules of grammar, right? Before you can actually communicate. And that's just with mouth and ears. Wait till you write it down. Oh, then it gets really complicated. Written language. Okay, let's just talk about spoken. So, if someone is playing, let's say, uh, Chopin. Let's have a Chopin nocturne. Oh, the communication that comes from that is just melts people. Da 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 dee, da 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 da, da 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 dee, da dee da dee da da, da da da. Right? Farewell, it's called. And people go, oh, you know. It's just, it touches the heart. Um, it's, a, it's a language. Now, maybe you can't say, um, please go to the post office and get, a, you know, a mailer, bring it back, uh, have it weighed, and bring the change back to me, you know, from this 50 or 20. You can't say that in music. But, on the other hand, the truths that come from Chopin that you can't say with language are profound. So, my point is what? There are some universal languages. Emotion, right? Yeah, including things like courage, including things like dignity, uh, music, you can make jokes in music, you know. So music has an amazing power. It's a language. And some people speak it better than others. Um, you could make the case that it's universal. So I want you to all to appreciate what an interesting life I have as a monk here in the Bay Area. So last night, uh, well Friday, we had a guest here. And the guest was uh, a nun, a Buddhist nun, from Nepal, whose name is Annie Choying Droma. And uh, Annie La is a singer. She's, uh, they call her the Buddhist nun rock star. The rock star Buddhist nun. Pop star Buddhist nun. She is, in that she, her songs in Nepal are, everyone knows them and loves them. So she was here Friday and we talked for time with Nipun of Service Base and, and other new friends. And uh, we traded some songs and she invited me to sing at her concert in Oakland the next night, which was last night. So we talked, what should I do? I said, yes, that'd be fine. I'm the neighborhood monk, okay? So I'm kind of welcoming her. So I sang um, Praise the Buddha. And praise the Buddha has, as a melody, amazing grace. Right? 
Upon the earth below the sky, the Buddha has no peer. And so I started out with that. Everybody sang along nice who could. And great. So at the end of the concert, Annie Choing Roma sang Amazing Grace in Nepali. And everybody just sang along, melted. And then she sang a verse in English with Tibetan inflection, with lots of vibrato in the way. And it was like amazing to hear Amazing Grace that way. You know, it was universal, universal. And I recalled one of the last times I sang that song was in Beijing at a place called Longchuan Si. And Master Xie Cheng was there and about uh, 400 of his disciples, all Chinese monks and laity, you know, nuns. And we had the projector and the screen like we did last night too. And I put Praise the Buddha on the screen in English and told everybody, this is Amazing Grace. And I said, you know that one, da 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 They all sang along. Reading the English off the screen, knowing the melody immediately, worldwide, universal. Everybody loves that tune, right? No matter whether it's Beijing or Oakland or Nepal or English, right? Nepal or English. So universal language. Within their lands are all manner of sentient beings' bodies and their bodies, again, all manner of lands, including humans, devas, and every kind of destiny, the six paths. And the Buddha knows and explains the Dharma for them all. How? He sings Amazing Grace. And they all go, oh, I know that tune. Well, that's not entirely facetious, right? How does he do it? Is this magic? No. It's software. Mm. It's software that you have on your hard drive of your mind, and I have on the hard drive of my mind. The Buddha activates it, and we get it. So, okay, how is that possible? Think of it this way. When the Buddha meditates, he enters samadhi. Safe to say that. And samadhi is using his mind at a quiet, still, tranquil, pure level. Same mind that I'm using right now, same mind you're using right now, but quieter, purer, more tranquil than mine. And I've had some kinds of meditation sometimes where I felt like I was kind of spelunking, like I was going down into a cave in a way. It had a feeling of kind of travel down. If you think of the mind as like a tree, for example, with roots, it felt like I was really going down on the roots that the longer I sat and the quieter I got. I can imagine that the Buddha in Samadhi goes really, really deep in his mind, yeah, to the roots of consciousness, beyond consciousness, into a place where words and language don't travel, but they arise from there. We, before we listen to sutras, do the Buddha, recite the Buddha's name. We do Wan Ke, we recite the Buddha's name. And we quiet our minds. Could it be that when the Buddha speaks Dharma, he's coming from <coughs> that place of samadhi at such a profound level where language is mostly symbol, maybe? It's not even words yet. It's maybe pictures. And when the Buddha speaks Dharma, he puts those pictures out, let's say, and we in our stillness go, mm hmm. Maybe he's totally bypassing language. He's not out there learning how to speak, you know, Esperanto or Portuguese. He's giving us profound images at a place where we pick it up undefended, unstressed. Uh, unmediated by culture. Maybe the Buddha is speaking language that is pre-cultural, so deep. 
Maybe. Something like that. That makes sense to me. I can kind of get that. Because, wowee, everybody thought Master Hua was speaking directly to them. Hmm. What's next? Da cha sui nian bian wei xiao. Xiao cha sui nian yi bian da. Ru shi shen tong wu you liang. Shi jian gong shuo bu neng jin. Large lands in a thought become small ones, and small lands in a thought can grow large. Explaining such infinite psychic powers would be impossible even should everybody speak together. Those words are missing in your copy. Would be impossible even should everybody speak together. Maybe even speak together at once, you could say. Okay, that's that needs to be there. Okay, more uh, description of what's going on here. Large in one thought become small, small become large in a thought. Now, how do we explain it? It says, don't even try. If you try to explain that together, everybody in this room and everybody else would be impossible. Because why? It's not the process of discriminating intellect. You can't learn enough to figure that out. But you can experience it immediately just by opening the ability yourself. Okay? That's kind of, hmm? I have to kind of take that on faith, but okay. So scientists should not read that and quit or be discouraged, right? It's not the case that you'll never know it. It's just we can't use our measuring tools to know it. We have to use direct experience. You can't think of it in thought. You can't explain it in words. Okay, next. What's next? Pu fa zi deng miao yin sheng cheng zan ru lai gong de yi Having made such wondrous sounds as these, in praise of the Tathagata's meritorious qualities, the gathered multitudes grew quiet, delighted. They gazed upwards, wishing to hear him speak. Okay, we're moving the plot forward here. Imagine if it was a movie. We, we would like to watch that movie, watch the Buddha speak, the Avatamsaka. But what's happening? Having heard the Buddha get ready, to, he's got everybody's channel, everybody's internet, RSS feed, everybody's messenger, what, page? No, link? No, messenger ID and password is known to the Buddha and he's got you. You're dialed into his Twitter feed. And now the audience goes, wow. We've, we, we're happy with what we've heard. The Buddha is talking to us directly. We're waiting. They grow quiet. They're happy. They're looking up. And they want to hear the Dharma. Okay, world honored one. Let's hear it. Eighth ground, coming down. Okay, so this is narrative. This is the, the, the sutra is like, I know people, people are so afraid of sutras. It's such a shame. What's hard to understand about that? We've just had a, a part that is magical, yeah. But if everything that we know, everything that we read has to be has to fit into our conscious mind, as Master Hua would say, that garbage can has been full for a long time. You know, you can't really squeeze anything more in there. However, when it's buka si, when it's inconceivable, what do we do? We can humbly put our palms together and say, "I want to learn more. I'm ready." I'm not going to pretend that I know everything or that everything that I know is 
all of reality, if I don't know it, it's not real. It's baloney. You know. So, next scene. Shi jie tuo yue fu qing yan jin si zhong hui jie ji jing yuan shuo sui ci zhi suo ru di ba di zhong zhu heng xiang Then Moon of Liberation made his request again and said, Everybody gathered here is serene and tranquil. Please tell us what comes next so we can learn to master every feature of the Eighth Grounds practice. They've come to learn how to be better bodhisattvas for the Better Bodhisattvas Business Bureau. Right? So they know that when they go back, they're going to have to deal with the problems of the living beings they have agreed to take across. And if they are wise, if they are compassionate and expedient and skillful, they'll be able to do it. They'll be able to actually help the people they care about figure stuff out. If they aren't able, they have to wait longer. And it's birth and death pain. It's misery out there. So of course they want to learn it. They teach me the eighth ground so I can put it into practice. I'm a uh, doctor in training and I need to know more surgical techniques. I need to recognize more symptoms. I need to get better at my diagnosis so that living beings suffering can end someday. That's what it's about. This is practical for them. Okay, any questions or comments online, Jerry? Anybody like furiously typing rebuttals? Yes, Connie. I was just thinking about how earlier you were talking about... Can't hear, sorry. Earlier you were talking about how we're all innately... Did you turn it on? It's not on. Okay, go ahead. Um, earlier you mentioned um, how we're all whole and complete. Can people hear her voice? Is it just me? Really? Speak up. Um, earlier you spoke about how we're all whole and complete, lacking nothing. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> how we could really embody that? <laughs> and how I, let, I lost the important sentence. I uh, said earlier how we are all what? How we are all whole and complete. Whole lacking, and complete. Lacking in nothing. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you if you you know, I no. If I elaborate on it more, it'll sound. You know, no. You just you don't believe it to begin with, and nobody does because why we've been ground into ourselves how deficient we are. It's hard to believe. Advertising exists precisely to tell us we're lacking. The reason why we buy stuff over and over and over and over and over again is because we're told that we need it. Right? The popcorn seller in the baseball stadium, who needs popcorn? Who needs popcorn? He's making this existential question. Who needs popcorn? Nobody needs popcorn. Are you kidding me? Who needs popcorn? Okay, two for the young man in the back. Here we go. Who needs popcorn? So, I told you the story in years past, like in the, in the early 20th century, 19th century, if you wanted to buy some shoes, you went to a store in town and there was a sign, a wooden sign, it had a boot on it. That was the cobbler. You went in and got a pair of shoes. They were black. They laced up. Maybe they didn't even have laid their boots. They fit you in there. Too tight, too loose. Okay, there are your shoes. Okay. And everybody on the street had the same kind of shoes you did. Women had theirs. Men had theirs. You wore them until what? The heels wore out and the, you wore a hole in the sole. What would you do? Take them back in. Turns them upside down. Takes out some leather. Hands them back to you. Right? Those were your shoes. 
you had some. <laughs> Your feet weren't bare. Okay. Comes advertising. And some clever fellow goes to the cobbler and says, you're only selling one pair of shoes per person. That's nowhere. He said, okay, let's make some red. Let's make some like brown. Let's make some with wingtip holes in them. Let's make some lower. Let's make some taller. And put them in the window and take down your sign and go, shoes, the new sign, right? And have a picture of some woman gazing lovingly at her closet with 12 pairs of shoes, you know, for different occasions. And the cobbler goes, why, why? Would they, they have shoes. No, no, you don't get it. You can sell multiple shoes to the same person. Who'd buy those? They've already got a pair, you know. No, you just don't understand, right? And so sure enough, everybody started buying shoes because they saw them and they were cool and they imagined, what would my feet look like in those and those and those and those? So advertising came along to tell everybody that they would be happier if they had many pairs of shoes. Sure enough, people started buying more shoes than they had feet for. And my goodness, you didn't. The poor cobblers who were there repairing shoes. How many? When was the last time you went to get shoes repaired? Can you, can you remember? Anybody? In UC Davis. Or in you, Davis I did. There was a shoe repair in Davis? Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Did he stitch like stitch straps on and stuff? No, I needed this buckle to be replaced. Buckles <laughs> replaced. Yeah, right. right. But not like before. Vaughn, did you ever get the soles of your shoes repaired? Never, right? You did, what was that? You? Yeah, I did. You did. Okay. Anybody? Kai, you ever get shoes repaired? Yeah. You did. Okay. David? Yes, right? Your dad did his own. See? There you go. He was not a cobbler. That's self reliance. Yeah, yeah. That's the American DIY. Do it yourself. So, saves a lot of money that way. And you don't have to go to the cobbler. Mr. Yap in Malaysia, lots of cobblers. Not anymore, right? Not many, huh? 没有多少修理鞋子的，都关门了。Yeah, we had a we had a shoe repair right up from my house in Toledo, and uh, my mother would take her shoes there, and because she wore them out, you know. And this guy, um, oh, his name was Pasquale, Senor Pasquale. Senor Pasquale was a character, and uh, <clears throat> I have to say, he had a son who um, worked with his dad. And I remember my mother and my sister exchanging a glance. I came back from college and they exchanged a glance and they said, well, we could always go over to Pasquale's and find some shoes to repair. And I went to check it out. And Pasquale Jr., they said, they described him, he looked like Adonis. He was this buff, handsome fellow. And they would find shoes to repair just to go in to interact with Pasquale Jr. And I never looked at my mom that way. It was like, she's flirting with the shoe guy, you know. My sister too, they were having fun. They had, a, you know, Pasquale Jr. on the string. And, and it's like, you know, come on. So yeah, and he, I mean, he was a handsome guy. But that's another story. That's, that's not, the shoes were the second most important part of that story. So, my goodness, you know, not anymore. I think Pasquale Jr. would learn software and went into, you know, high tech or something because nobody came to have their shoes repaired anymore. So, advertising tells us we need, and it's the brave, brave person who says, you know, I don't need it. I don't need it. And actually, if we can't afford it because we're on a budget, we don't have scads of money to, to spend on stuff, we're not necessarily unhappy. If we're in a world where the only thing that counts is Hermes handbags, Ming Pai, Chanel, right? Dolce and Gabbana, Louis Vuitton. Have you all seen the Instagram feed called Rich People of California? There's an Instagram feed where it's all about showing off your Ferrari. And people just, you know, that's all they do. They show off their... 
There's one the other day. This I saw it. There was an article in the Chronicle. That's why I know about it. And the mother was taking her 11-year-old daughter in to buy her first LV handbag. Her first Louis Vuitton handbag. At, you know, ten thousand dollars, something like that. Ten-year-old. Yeah. Anyway, so there is a um, a new metric that I saw. A new way, of, a new measure that said. $75,000 per year is the salary mark after which more money does not increase happiness. That if you have minimum $75,000 per year, they said, and then suddenly you get hundred thousand, you get a big salary boost of a 25%, happiness doesn't come along with it, they said. At that point, it becomes... It brings its own frustration. Once you're in the next bracket, that you, it comes with a lot of more suffering. Interestingly, fascinating, you know, research, and I'd like to track that down. Anybody know? Anybody see that one? There was a. There's. This is a social science discovery that seventy-five thousand dollars is a. There's a, a threshold above which, if you get more, it comes with frustration. It doesn't lead to happiness automatically. It can if you have, you know, suppose you need medical money or something like that, but it's not for sure that more money past that will make you happier. That's really interesting research. So, Connie's question was, you know, say more about we have all we need. Okay. Um, I just... uh, to talk about what an interesting life I lead as a Buddhist monk in the Bay Area. Um, last night, I was welcoming a Nepali nun uh, before her concert at the First Congregational Church in Oakland. She invited me to sing a song. So I opened the show singing an American English language praise of the Buddha for an American audience, introducing a Nepalese Buddhist bhikshuni uh, for her concert. And she sang mantras and he uh, is suffering because he lost his beloved 10-year-old son. And then his life fell apart. And so the story takes him into the Sangha, shaves his head, becomes a monk, and the senior monk, who is his good and wise advisor, puts him into a position on a mountain. Her shoulders is Thailand. And that's all. And sure enough, in this film, the uh, hero is down to rock bottom. Nothing left. Right? Jia po ren wang yu nan kai. Family is lost, people are gone, words are hard to find. Right? That's where he is. And he's picked up out of the gutter by this compassionate monk and has his head shaved, put on a robe, and puts him in a cave on the mountainside with nothing but a couple dogs and mosquitoes. And the guy spits his guts out and cry, why? And it's a magical moment because he sits back down to meditate and his son appears. And everybody in the, in the whole theater went right at that moment because his son's dead. His son appears and says, Dad, I'm going now. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. And the dad says, where are you going? And he goes, up there. Where? And the boy goes away. And the father, the the new monk, right, climbs, climbs, climbs to the top of the mountain and gets to the top where the wind is blowing. And sits there and meditates. And let's go acknowledges his son's death. 
and is reborn through the Dharma. And it's magical, but it's you all know we had the very same thing happen here in the monastery, right? I'll tell that story in a bit. So powerful movie, and because this guy could let it could could pick up the Dharma and let go his um, let go his his grief, his anger, his confusion, his hurt. He was reborn. And uh, the Dharma works when we commit to it. And we need it. If we have a bunch of choices, well, certainly uh, that's a lesson that I learned on my pilgrimage because I was kind of down to the bone on the highway with the trucks running by. And I didn't even have my words to defend me. So that was great, but just the interesting juxtaposition of being uh, introducing a Nepali Buddhist nun and then today introducing a Thai Buddhist monk and following us today over at the Raphael, Raphael Theater, the Raphael Theater, um, was another film that we didn't know was going to be playing. What was it called? Tsuji, Doing a World of Good. It's a documentary about Tsuji, made by a Dutch filmmaker, feature-length film. And there were all our friends from Tsuji, standing there in their uniform, their blues, in the lobby of the, of the theater, saying, oh, you've come to see our movie? And we said, oh, we really can't. We can't. We've got to go back. I'm so sorry. Of course we want to see your movie, but I've got to do one ku. They're waiting for me at the and then I got a lecture tonight. They're going, oh, well, okay, you know. But there they were. There was Xie Mingjing and there was Al Shun and, and everybody. And they didn't know about the movie until like two weeks ago when the flyers for the Buddhist Film Festival came out. They didn't even know it was being made. Suji is a big organization. So they got the word, oh, there's going to be a movie about Suji showing at the film and they go, oh, we better go, you know, otherwise they would have told us, right? So it, it started at 4.30, went to probably 6. And uh, so we didn't get to see that, but we hope to see it later. And it's, it's a movie about discovering Tsuji. Okay, so let me tell you that story. What happened here, there were two young people in our E, uh, in our CBS, the Cal Buddha Society. I was, uh, this was 1994, 1995. And I was the advisor for the Cal Buddha Society. We had two young people, very brilliant young kids. One was a junior, one was a senior. The girl was a the senior, the, the, the girl was a sophomore, the boy was a junior. They're both originally from Taiwan. They were boy and girlfriend. And they were good Buddhists. And they graduate, they uh, didn't graduate, they had more years to go. But school was out. And to celebrate the last day of school, they went over to Baker Beach, the western edge of San Francisco. And there's they walked past the signs out into the tide and were swept away and drowned, both of them. And they didn't find their bodies. They were just sucked out. So just for those of you who are listening, pay attention to those signs at the beach, especially when there's no lifeguard. There wasn't. They shouldn't have done it, and they did. And they died. And so it was a real real lesson in impermanence for their classmates in our Buddhist group. So we had a funeral service here and Chancellor Tian, Tian Changlin, the Chinese Chancellor of Berkeley, sent his vice chancellor to come. A uh, Hispanic gentleman, forgotten his name, good man. And he sat right there while we did the Amitabha Sutra for these kids. Okay, interesting was the girls 
mom was a super Buddhist, right? Oh, knew all the stuff, could do all the stuff, you know. And yet, face to face with the loss of her dear daughter, her faith in the Dharma totally evaporated and she was so upset. Why did the Buddha take my daughter away from me? Right around. And we're going, that's not exactly the way <laughs> the Dharma explains this. And she was a Buddhist, but she totally, it was all superficial. She had no understanding of the Dharma. The father of the boy who died, who drowned, was a kind of an atheist, didn't have much faith in anything, and yet was a good heart. He came up from L.A., and he came with his family, and he came in and he was just like, he couldn't believe that he'd lost his precious son. So he came and talked to me afterwards. I said, is there anything you can, you know, tell me that will help? I said, yeah, you bet. Here. I said, this is strong medicine, but I think you can take it. This is called the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra. Sutra, the past vows of Earth Store Bodhisattva. I said, read this. If it's too much, I understand, but I think you could use some real grounding and call me or email me. And email was still pretty much brand new back then. And so he said, okay, I will thank you. And I could see it, it clicked, you know. So the mother just totally turned against Buddhism. Her Buddhism was not Buddhism at all. It was just some identity. And when it came time when Buddhism could have helped her, she wasn't ready to be helped. So then I got this knock on the door. And this is when I was by myself here. I was the only monk here for years and so it was right after lunch on I think a Friday or something just an ordinary day and who was it it was the dad with his son come up from LA and he knocked on the door and I opened it came in he was like he said I want to tell you oh he said can I tell you something I said sure he said you know I I uh he said can, can we go over there where you said that his plaque, his pieway is? I said, yeah, let's go down there. And down there, he said, light some incense. So he offered incense, you know, and I offered incense. His son offered, his other son. And I said, why don't you just, uh, why don't you just uh, kneel here? He said, no, I got to tell you. He said, uh, I never, ever take a nap. He said, I only sleep at night. I never sleep at noon. But for some reason, yesterday, he said, I was in L.A. I drive, drove straight up to tell you this. Yesterday, I took a nap. Just I've, something told me to go lie down. And I lay down. And as soon as my head hit the pillow, my son came back. And it was so funny because I couldn't see his feet. His feet were like covered in clouds. I could see his whole body. But his feet were covered in clouds and he came from a distance. He came walking towards me and I put out my hand to touch him and I touched him and his body was warm. <laughs> I'm going, uh-huh. And he said, now you think I'm crazy. He said, but I'm telling you the truth. He said, this just, I never had anything. And I said, have you been like reading the Earth Store? He says, yeah, I recite it every day. I've been reciting the Earth Store Sutra all the time. He said, it was really good. And I took it to heart and I've been reciting it. And I said, and then what happened? He said, well, my son said to me, Dad, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I can't stay. I got to go. But you take care of yourself. I'm worried about you. And then he went away. And I, I woke up from my nap and I was so happy. So I got in the car to come and tell you this. And I said, that's good. That's nice. I'm glad you did. <laughs> you know. And so I said, why don't you, you know, you're welcome to spend some time with your your son's plaque here and you can bow and recite or restore sutra if you like. And so he said, okay. So I left him here in the rebirth hall and I went into the kitchen and I was making some tea and I heard this shout and I thought, uh-oh, you know, what happened? Like, oh, so I came running back in and he was there. He said, Fasher, look. And we looked at the sensor and here was the stick of incense, but the ash had fallen and made a complete perfect circle. It didn't fall off. And he goes, 
Ho, oh, ni kan, yuan man. Said, look, it's perfect and done. It's all done. And he went away with a happy heart. And it's so funny that the mother of the daughter, who was like the big Buddhist, you know, was like, mm. she, I think she finally went off and got baptized. She figured the Buddha had been bad to her. And yet the guy who lost his son, who had no particular religion, completely embraced the principles of the Dharma after he woke up to impermanence by losing his son. So we still have their plaques right there in the hall uh, since that time. It's been 20 some years. I said 94. No, it wasn't 94. It was because uh, we weren't here then. It was, must have been 96. And so in the movie today, having the, the young man come back to the come back to the father and tell him, I'm okay, I'm leaving, don't worry about me, was something that we experienced here. It's magical, yeah, but it can happen. The key is that we have to need it. It works when you really need it. If Buddha Dharma is there as a as a source of blessings it works too but it it won't be a vehicle to carry us across So let's transfer the merit and then I'm going to, don't go away, stay with me because we're going to show some slides and some movies. First we have to transfer the merit. Last night Annie Cho Ying Droma for transference had everybody sing Om Mani Padme Om. It was very nice. So we have our own music, we've got the dedication of merit, but more important than the music is what we do with our hearts. The music is the vehicle, but the content is what we're giving away, what we're transferring. So make a wish. So may it 
be so. Um, let me make an announcement now, which is that this coming Tuesday is going to be our first Tea and Dharma Night of the new series. And it's going to be at Tiant's Tea Shop on 4th Street in Berkeley at 7, not 7.30, 7 o'clock. means we have to leave here uh, probably 6.25, 6.30, get there time, 7 o'clock. And some of the world's finest tea will be there, along with uh, some of the world's finest conversation and friendship and fellowship. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, mindfulness and after. So when you stand up from your meditation, how do you plug that into your life? And questions of who am I? Who am I? Where most of us, uh, we, uh, one of the reasons why America is in such a, a difficult place right now is because uh, there are two particular worldviews in, colli- in collision, in conflict. One worldview is um, I belong here because my ancestors came earlier And we don't like anybody else to come here because they got here later. That's a conflict with the truth that there's only one species, only, I'm sorry, only one race of people who were here originally, and that's the red people, Native Americans, the first peoples of the continent. Uh, Everybody else is an immigrant. It's just a question of when we got here. And probably in this room right now, could I see the hands of people who were born here in the Bay Area? Not a single one. David, where were you born in Texas? Los Angeles. Okay, Los Angeles. So you're a Californian. How many Californians here? Born in California? Just one. Just one. Everybody else. Right? Online? Everybody raise your hand. Who's my son? Right. So, uh, yeah, how about that? We're all from somewhere else recently. Recently, right? And that's a reality. The globe is not the way it was in the 1900s. It's a shrinking place. Everybody comes from somewhere else. And if you can't accept that, Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a-changing. Right? It's, you got to move. You can't stay here in that old view because it's not reality anymore. So, that's a collision. So we're going to be in, looking into that Tuesday night over at Teon's. Please come by. Let me announce also, tomorrow is our day-long Buddha recitation. There is a Buddhist perspective on immigration that says we are all citizens of the Dharma realm. That our bodies are not the way to figure out who we are. Our souls, our spirits, our Buddha natures have a deeper, older identity that is true. Another story. Okay, tomorrow, starting at 7.30 here at the Berkeley Monastery, come recite the Buddha's name for a day. You can do parts of it if you like. Stay for the whole day, get a lunch, and uh, come away after hours of reciting the Buddha's name profoundly different than you were in the morning. That's a, there's an identity. We're all uh, heading for the Pure Land. Just not right away, right? Not today, but in the future. Okay, now that being said, those are our announcements. Uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Husher are in Atlanta, Georgia in a place called Hard Labor Creek State Park uh, with a a summer camp led by Master Mingguang of Taipei, wonderful monk, friend of ours. And uh, they will be back in a few days to continue through the summer. Uh, Anybody who's interested in going to Europe with us on a trip in September, see this gentleman over here who will raise his hand. Jason, there he is, good. He'll have all the details and the website. Okay, let's bring the screen down, turn the projector on, and show some slides.
I did a slideshow individually of a few slides and a few movies, but I put them together uh, at City of 10,000 Buddhas last week to show folks with some lovely music. And I need to say, this music is going out to the internet and I haven't licensed it. It's music that I borrowed from Maeve Gilchrist's CD, which I purchased. She's a harp player. It's magnificent, beautiful music. Um, and I give her credit at the end, but I haven't asked her permission. So to put it out on YouTube on our Dharma Realm Live, this is actually not quite kosher. The other music is Mike Dowling playing his slide guitar. Mike is one of my guitar teachers and colleagues. He's a wonderful man. And uh, so the, the, the musical tunes that you're going to be hearing are not yet licensed. So we're asking people to please be judicious if they show this, be, be uh, mindful of other people's property. Here we go. Enjoy. Pictures from Australia, 2017. Okay, I want to take it back so we can get the benefit of all that. Here we go. Yes, yeah, we can. Um, Jason, would you mind turning off? It's, no, okay. Jin Fo Shi, Nega. Can't get it? I'll get it. There we go. Good. Thank you. Here we go. Those are butcher birds, by the way, moth eaters. <laughs>
that's the butcher bird again with the, with her daughter. Oops. Just two birds. That's a husband and wife duet.
you go. So you can see why it's hard to uh, to be content living in the city after you've got so many uh, relationships happening outside in nature, and it really makes you. Uh, can we take the screen up, Jerry? And I'll, I'll do the I'll do the projector. It really makes you uh, want to find the nature where you are, you know. Uh, the reason why Australia is such a uh, rich place f- to observe nature is because it has the lowest population density of any first world country. There's more room around every individual. So the animals haven't been disturbed, you know. You imagine what it was like right where we're standing just a hundred years ago? They say, they say there were grizzly bears in Strawberry Creek right on campus, currently the campus. You know. So coming back, you can see deer. Do you have deer where you are, David? Not? Nope, they're just not far up, up in the Richmond Hills. There are deer. And uh, if you live in El Cerrito, you see deer every day, you know, every night. They're down in your yard munching away on your cherries. So, anyway, so humanity has done quite a job of replacing everybody else with us. So, yeah, that's what we do. Anyway, Australia is, they say there are 40,000 wild koalas left. And... Once they're gone, that's it. So it's at a critical phase right now. The people who know, who are watching, how quickly the gum trees, the eucalyptus are being cut down for development, they say that uh, they may have to just build a big park for koalas or else they'll be all gone. The iconic, that and kangaroos, the iconic animal of Australia is in serious danger right now. Automobiles, and chopping down the trees that they eat. That's why they're doing it. So. All right. So with that in mind, maybe we can be grateful for the diversity that we have now and try our best to save it. Please have a week full of blessings and wisdom. May all things come your way. May all your wishes come true. And wishes for goodness, that is. And may all your wishes for negativity just vanish in your mind. As they say, may the doors to the evil destinies close and may the right gates to heaven to humanity and to nirvana open in front of all of us so see you next week To the venerable master.